A very good evening aspirants, welcome to Hindu newspaper analysis brought to you by Shankar IAS Academy for the date 10th of November 2022. Displayed here are the list of articles that we are going to discuss today. Without any delay, let's get into the article discussion. Today we are going to start our discussion with this article here. See yesterday. A 6.6 magnitude earthquake struck the lower Himalayan region and because of this at least 6 persons were killed in Nepal and this is the crux of the news article given here. In this context let's learn about earthquakes from prelims perspective. See in simple words an earthquake is the shaking of the earth. See it is a natural event and caused due to the release of energy which generates waves that travel in all directions. Now you may have a doubt, from where this energy is released and why does the earth shake? See the release of energy occurs along a fault. Here a fault is a sharp break in the crustal rocks. Know that the rocks along the fault tend to move in the opposite directions. But however, their tendency to move apart at some point of time overcomes the friction. And as a result of friction, these blocks get deformed and eventually they slide past one another abruptly, that is quickly. And this causes a release of energy and the energy waves travel in all directions. See this abrupt or quick slide past event causes the shaking of the earth. Know that the point where the energy is released is called the focus of an earthquake and it is also called the hypocenter. See the energy waves travelling in different directions reach the surface. The point on the surface that is nearest to the focus is called the epicenter. See the epicenter is the first one to experience the energy waves and it is a point directly above the focus. Now talking about the types, see earthquake waves are basically two types. They are body waves and surface waves. Firstly, let's see about body waves. See, body waves are generated due to the release of energy at the focus and they tend to move in all directions. Know that body waves travel throughout the body of the earth and then the body waves interact with the surface rocks and they generate new set of waves called the surface waves. Now let's see about the surface waves. See, surface waves move along the surface of the earth. Here, the velocity of the waves changes as they travel through materials with different densities. So, denser the material, the higher is the velocity. And also note that the surface waves are the one that are most destructive. They cause displacement of rocks and collapse of structures like buildings, houses, etc. So, this is about the surface waves. See, as far as the types of earthquake waves, we saw two types. One is body waves and the other one is surface waves. And the body waves, it is further classified into two types. One is P waves, that is the primary waves and the other one is S waves, that is the secondary waves. Firstly, let's see about the P waves. See, they move faster and they are the first to arrive at the surface. And that is exactly why they are called as primary waves. See, these P waves, they are similar to sound waves. So, they travel through gaseous, liquid and solid materials. Now, the second type is S waves. See, they arrive at the surface with some time lag. And these are called as secondary waves. An important fact about S waves is that they can travel only through the solid materials. And this only helped the scientists to understand the structure of interior of the earth. So this is all about the basics of earthquakes and the types of waves. Now finally, let's see how earthquakes are measured. See, earthquake events are measured using two scales. They are magnitude scale and intensity scale. See, the magnitude scale is known as the richer scale. Here the magnitude relates to the energy released during the earthquake. In Richter scale, the magnitude is expressed in absolute numbers, that is from 0 to 10. And this is about the magnitude scale. The second one is intensity scale and it is also known as Mercalli scale. Here the intensity scale takes into account the visible damage caused by the earthquake event. And the range of the intensity scale is from 
1 to 12. So, this is all about the earthquake that you should know. And with this, we have come to the end of this particular article discussion. In this discussion, we saw about earthquake, the types of earthquake waves and the types of body waves. And finally, we ended our discussion by seeing measurement of earthquakes. Now, with these points in mind, let us move on to the next article discussion. Now, take this next news article. It reports about the exclusion of nuclear power and large hydropower projects exceeding 25 megawatts from the ambit of sovereign green bonds. So, what is this sovereign green bond? What is its significance? We shall know about them in this article discussion. See, the issuance of sovereign green bond was announced in Union Budget 2022-23. See, it was announced as a part of government's overall market borrowings. That is, these bonds will be issued by the government and the proceeds from these bonds will be used in the environment-friendly public sector projects. So, what is the result of this? See, these bonds and the proceeds from these bonds will help in decreasing the carbon intensity of the economy. And that is exactly why sovereign green bonds were announced in Union Budget 2022-23. And know that the government has unveiled a record borrowing of Rs. 14.95 trillion in financial year 2022-2023. See, these green bonds, they help in attaining ambitious targets decided by the government. For example, it helps in achieving 175 gigawatt of renewable energy capacity by the year 2022 and it will also help in achieving net zero carbon emissions by the year 2070. See, these bonds, they are used in funding the green projects. See, green project classification is based on the following principles. Firstly, such project should encourage energy efficiency in resource utilization. Secondly, such project should reduce the carbon emissions and greenhouse gases. And thirdly, it should promote climate resilience or the adaptation. And finally, it should value and improve the natural ecosystems and biodiversity, especially in accordance with the Sustainable Development Goal principles. So, this is about the sovereign green bonds. Now, let us move on to the categories for which the proceeds raised from the sovereign green bonds will be used. And the eligible categories include renewable energy, energy efficiency, clean transportation, climate change adaptation, sustainable water and waste management, pollution prevention and control, green buildings, sustainable management of living natural resources and land use, terrestrial and aquatic biodiversity conservation. Here you can see that the expenditures that are directly related to the fossil fuel are excluded. And also remember, for the process of project evaluation and selection, Ministry of Finance has constituted a Green Finance Working Committee with representation from relevant ministries. Know that it is chaired by Chief Economic Advisor and this committee will meet at least twice a year to support the Ministry of Finance with selection and evaluation of projects. See here, initial evaluation of the project will be the responsibility of the concerned ministry in consultation with the experts. Now look at this image here. In this image, you can see the procedure for selection of eligible green expenditure. And the image also mentions about the composition of Green Finance Working Committee. So just have a look at this. So this is all about the eligible categories of projects for which proceeds raised from the sovereign green bonds will be utilized. Now that's all for this article discussion. In this article discussion, we saw about sovereign green bonds, its significance, we saw about green project and the principles of green project. And finally, we ended our discussion by seeing the eligible categories of projects for which the proceeds from the sovereign green bonds will be used. Now, with these points in mind, let us move on to the next article discussion. For our next discussion, we are going to take this news article. See, this news article talks about the Pashmina shawls. See, the news is that the traders of the Pashmina shawls are complaining about the light microscopy method which is used for testing the authenticity of Pashmina shawls. 
See, they are complaining about this method because it is an obsolete testing method and it has identified the presence of Shatush god hair which negatively impacted the traders of Pashmina shawls. And this is the crux of the news article given here. In this context, we are going to discuss about Pashmina shawl and then we'll discuss about the Shatush also. Firstly, we are going to take the Pashmina shawls. See, the Pashmina is obtained from a breed of mountain goats and the breed is called as Capra Hircus. See, they are found on Changtang Plateau in Tibet and parts of Ladakh. So, who manufactured these Pashmina shawls? See, the manufacture of Pashmina is a largely unorganized cottage and handicraft industry. See, this unorganized industry provides employment and livelihood to approximately 6 lakh people residing in the Ladakh and Tibet area. Note that in the year 2019, the Bureau of Indian Standards published an Indian standard for identification, marking and labeling of Pashmina shawls for its purity. So, this is about the Pashmina shawls. Now, coming to Shatush or the King of Ults. See, it is a fine undercoat fiber obtained from the Tibetan antelope. And this Tibetan antelope is locally known as Chiru. See, it is a species living mainly in the northern parts of Changtang Plateau in the Tibet. See, they offer high levels of smoothness and warmth. And it is a highly expensive commodity. But what happened is, the population of Tibetan antelope declined dramatically. So, the sites, that is the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species of Wild Fauna and Flora, listed the Tibetan antelope in Appendix 1. And this was in the year 1979. And this led to the ban on sale and trade of Shatush shawls and scarves. So, this is about the Pashmina shawls and the Shatush shawls. Now, coming to the current problem. See, the materials of both the shawls have similar physical properties and tangibility. So, it becomes difficult to differentiate one shawl from the other. See, it can be differentiated only with advanced scientific forensic methods. But currently, the examiner who examines the authenticity of the shawls uses only the light microscopy method. And this method largely depends on the extent of expertise of the examiner. And that is exactly why traders of the Pashmina shawls are complaining about the light microscopy method. See, if they use the light microscopy method, then it will negatively impact the traders of Pashmina shawls. Since both the shawls have similar physical properties and tangibility, the examiner, if they say that Pashmina shawls have shatush hair in it, then it will reduce the trade of Pashmina shawls, right? And that is exactly why I said it will negatively impact the traders. And this is the problem that we discussed in today's news article also. Now finally, before concluding, let us see why Pashmina shawls are so significant. The first reason is that it is an integral part of the traditional wear of many community. And secondly, due to its warmth and softness, it is exported to many countries. So, it enhances the trade happening in the economy and that is exactly why they are significant. So, these are the two main reasons why Pashmina shawls are so significant in the country. To promote the Pashmina shawls, modern scanning electron microscope technique and DNA tests should be incorporated as the testing methods. And that's all for this article discussion. In this discussion, we saw about Pashmina shawls, Shatush shawls, and the significance of Pashmina shawls. Now with these points in mind, let us move on to the next article discussion. Now have a look at this text and context article. This news article talks about air pollution in the national capital region. Yes, it is about the Delhi's air pollution problem. So in this discussion, we are going to see about certain facts regarding air pollution in Delhi and the measures taken by the government to address it. But before that, the syllabus relevant to the article is highlighted here for your reference. Please go through it. Before going into the discussion, we need to know about National Ambient Air Quality Standards. See, National Ambient Air Quality Standards are standards for the air quality in the country. And it is set by the Central Pollution Control Board that is CPCB. See, it is applicable all over the country. 
and the Central Pollution Control Board draws this power to set up the National Ambient Air Quality Standards from the Air Pollution Act of 1981. See this National Ambient Air Quality Standards was revised in 2009. And this revision was done to include 12 categories of pollutants including PM2.5 that is particulate matter with the diameter under 2.5 microns. See this PM2.5 it is a very dangerous pollutant. We have seen about this in many of our analysis before. And why it is a dangerous pollutant? See it is dangerous because it can penetrate deep into the lungs and it can even enter the bloodstream. And this will result in cardiovascular and respiratory impacts. See, we all know particulate matter is primarily generated by fuel combustion from different sectors like transport, energy, households, industry and even agriculture. Now coming back to the 12 pollutants that are included in the National Ambient Air Quality Standards that was revised in the 2009. The 12 pollutants include PM10 that is particulate matter with diameter under 10 microns, PM2.5, nitrogen dioxide, sulfur dioxide, carbon monoxide, ozone, ammonia, lead, benzene, benzopyrene, arsenic and nickel. Now with this information let us move on to see the pollution standards that are fixed for all of these pollutants. Here look in this table. See the acceptable annual limit for PM2.5 is 40 micrograms per cubic meter and the annual acceptable limit for the PM10 is 60 micrograms per cubic meter. And likewise the pollution standards for all of the 12 pollutants are given here. So pause the video and just go through it. Now coming to Delhi's air pollution. See last week Delhi was once again covered in a haze of smog and this resulted in very poor air quality. See as we all know this has become a trend during the winter months in Delhi. And when we talk about the reason for this increase in Delhi's pollution, the first thing that comes to our mind is stubble burning, right? See if you want to know more about stubble burning, watch the 26th October 2022 Hindu News Analysis. We have covered elaborately about stubble burning in that discussion. Now coming to the other reasons that contribute to the Delhi's pollution. They include Delhi's population, industrialization, urbanization and the increase in motorized private vehicles. See here I have given the polluters and their share to the Delhi's pollution. Just go through it. And regarding each and every reason that led to the increase of air pollution in Delhi, we have seen all those reasons in our November 5th, 2022 Hindu News Analysis. So I don't want to waste your time by repeating all these reasons here also. But instead, we'll see about the measures taken by the government in controlling the air pollution in Delhi. But firstly, we'll see when did Delhi start acting against air pollution. It was in March 1995. The Supreme Court, while hearing a plea, noted that Delhi was the world's fourth most polluted city. So the court took note of two polluting factors. One is the vehicles and the other one is the industries. So in the year 1996, the Supreme Court ordered the closure and relocation of over 1300 highly polluting industries from Delhi's residential areas. See this was to be done in a phased manner. And then for the vehicular pollution, the Supreme Court made the Delhi government to submit an action plan to curb the pollution. So later in that year, that is the 1996, the Delhi government submitted an action plan. And after the submission of the action plan, the Supreme Court realized that there is a need for technical assistance. And then there is also need for advice in decision making and implementation of the orders given by the Supreme Court. And hence, it asked the Ministry of Environment to establish an authority for Delhi. And this only led to the creation of Environmental Pollution Control Authority of Delhi, NCR, EPCA. And this happened in the year 1998. So what did the EPCA do? See, they submitted the report containing two-year action plan in 1998 itself. And then the Supreme Court ordered the Delhi Transport Corporation, bus fleet, taxis and autos to switch to compressed natural gas. 
and then it also ordered the phasing out of all the pre 1990 autos so this is the order of supreme court based on the report of epca now we are going to take a quick detour here and understand what is compressed natural gas see it is an environment friendly alternative automotive fuel and that is why the supreme court has recommended the switch to compressed natural gas see as the name suggests it is a natural gas compressed under pressure so that more of it occupies lesser volume in your fuel tank see compressed natural gas is compressed to a pressure of 200 to 250 kg per cm square and in this compressed form it occupies less than 1 percentage of its volume at atmospheric pressure see this compressed natural gas is important because it is a cleaner fuel and it plays an important role in reducing vehicular greenhouse gas emissions and it also helps in reducing environmental pollution significantly he also note that compressed natural gas differs from the liquefied petroleum gas so what is the difference here see the constituents that are present in cng and lpg is the main difference see compressed natural gas it is gaseous and it consists of about 80 to 90 percentage of methane whereas when you take lpg it is a liquid and it consists of compressed mixture of propane and butane in liquid form So here our detour is ending. Now coming back to the discussion. See, apart from the orders of the Supreme Court, other measures have also been taken to reduce air pollution in Delhi. And the other measures include the complete removal of leaded petrol, the removal of 15 and 17 year old commercial vehicles, and then placing a cap of 55,000. on the number of two stroke engine auto rickshaws and the conversion of coal based power plants in delhi to gas based ones see these measures are taken because at that time these were the main factors that contributed to 80% of delhi's air pollution and around that time only the center decided to establish a network of monitoring stations under the national air quality program see this is to measure key pollutants Do you all remember the national ambient air quality standards? We saw that at the starting of our discussion. So under these standards, permissible limits were given by the Central Pollution Control Board. We saw that also, right? So after establishing a network of monitoring stations under the National Air Quality Program, pollutants like PM10, sulfur dioxide and nitrogen oxides they were all measured in the region of Delhi. and it was found that delhi was the most polluted of all the states and union territories each year see delhi's annual pm 2.5 levels increased by 40 percentage from 80 micrograms per cubic meter to 111 micrograms per cubic meter and it is also found that delhi was the most polluted city in the world in terms of pm 2.5 levels and then in the year 2016 During the winter season, Delhi witnessed one of the worst incidents of pollution induced smog. This is because PM 2.5 and PM 10 levels reached 999 micrograms per cubic meter in parts of Delhi. Now you might have a question. Why even after so many measures the Delhi's air pollution level is increasing? See the first reason for failure is the seasonal measures. See Delhi's pollution problems are present throughout the year but what we are doing we are taking measures seasonally so taking seasonal measures will not yield a reduction in pollution levels this is the first reason and the next reason is that odd even vehicular rationing rule is applying only to the private vehicles see nearly 17% of the vehicular emissions is contributed by heavy freight vehicles that is vehicles that are carrying cargo so blocking the private vehicles alone is not going to make a big change in the pollution level and this is one reason and the next reason is increase in the number of private vehicles like cars bikes etc see we all saw that a cap of 55000 was introduced to the number of auto rickshaw sector right and due to the lack of availability of the required public bus fleet there is a tremendous increase in the purchase of private vehicles and this is also one another reason for increasing air pollution in delhi 
and the next reason is that though the industries were removed out of the capital in a phased manner delhi remains as one of the biggest clusters of small scale industries so this is one another reason and the next reason is the compressed natural gas see this compressed natural gas led to the increase of carbon monoxide levels and apart from this illegal burning of garbage fills also led to the increase in air pollution in delhi see finally we all know stubble warning right that is also a reason for the failure of pollution control measures see proper machineries have to be given in a subsidized rate for the farmers of the neighboring states to address the stubble burning issue and then only delhi's air pollution will be reduced and the pollution control measures will also be fruitful now that's all about this article discussion in this discussion we saw about the national ambient air quality standards the pollutants referred in it and its permissible limits we also saw about different polluters and their share to delhi's pollution and we saw the measures taken by government to address the delhi's air pollution problem and finally we ended our discussion by seeing the reasons why the air pollution control measures are failing now with these points in mind let us move on to the next article discussion now take a look at this news article it reports about the recent tussle between kerala governor and kerala government to understand the article better let me give you a brief outline about the issue see according to the ugc regulations 2018 the governor of the state is the ex officio chancellor of the universities in that state and as a chancellor he shall appoint the vice chancellor based on the names recommended by search cum selection committees so he is only appointing the vice chancellors see higher education institutions particularly those funded by the ugc follow these rules so as governor he functions with the aid and advice of council of ministers but as chancellor he acts independently of the council of ministers and takes his own decisions on all university matters but what happened is kerala government recently approved the appointment of vice chancellors for 11 universities and this is the starting point of all the issues see in reaction to this appointment governor mohammed khan issued notices to the vice chancellors of the state universities concerned he even asked them to resign the office so this is the tussle that was going on but yesterday the kerala government decided to remove the governor as chancellor of state universities and they were seeking to replace him with renowned academic experts so what is the way to replace him see to initiate such replacement the state cabinet will request the governor himself to promulgate an ordinance removing him from the position it's funny right they are asking him to promulgate an ordinance to remove him from the position and if he disagrees with the ordinance and withhold the promulgation then the government will introduce a bill in the assembly to remove him so either way the governor will lose his powers as chancellor and if you ask me on what basis the state government is making all these moves my answer will be punchi commission see this commission it was constituted in 2007 by the then congress led union government to study the center state relations see the commission submitted its report in seven volumes and four supplementary volumes and in that the commission had vouched against granting the governor the power of the chancellors and the commission also advised the state government to stop imposing chancellors role on governors and based on this only the state government is acting now see apart from this recommendation the commission gave 312 recommendations in this report so what we are going to do is we are going to see the crucial ones especially with respect to the governor so regarding the appointment of the governor the punchi commission recommended that the governor should be an eminent person and he should not belong to the state where he is to be posted and this is one recommendation secondly the commission recommended that the person who is slated to be a governor should not have participated in active politics at even the local level for at least a couple of years before his appointment 
So the commission it vouched against the participation of the person who is to be appointed as governor in politics, and it should not be even at the local level. And thirdly, the commission stated that the chief minister should have a say in the appointment of the governor. And finally, it recommended that the appointment of governor should be entrusted to a committee comprising the prime minister, home minister, speaker of Lok Sabha, chief minister of the concerned state. And apart from this, even vice president can also be involved in the process. So these are some of the recommendations of the Punchi Commission regarding the appointment of governor. First one is he should not belong to the state where he is to be posted. and he should not have participated in active politics even at local level for at least a couple of years before his appointment and state chief minister should have a say in the appointment of governor and finally the appointment of governor should be based on the recommendation of a committee comprising prime minister home minister speaker of lok sabha chief minister and even vice president now the second major category that we are going to see is regarding the removal of the governor See Punchi Commission has many recommendations regarding the removal of governor. We are going to see that only. For the office of governor, the doctrine of pleasure should end and it should be deleted from the constitution also. That is, governor should not be removed at the whim of central government. Instead, a resolution by the state legislature should be there to remove the governor. And this is one recommendation. and secondly it said that there should be provisions for impeachment of the governor by the state legislature along the same lines as that of the president so these are the recommendations regarding the removal of the governor so with this we have also come to the end of this particular article discussion in this discussion we saw why there is a tussle between kerala governor and kerala government and we saw based on what criteria the state government is making the moves and finally we ended our discussion by seeing some of the important recommendations of punchi commission regarding the appointment of governor and the removal of governor see i am giving you these list of recommendations of punchi commission for you to use these points in the mains answer see governor has always been an evergreen topic in upsc mains one year or the other a question about governor has been asked in the mains so in the way forward or in the introduction if you quote the recommendations of the important commissions like this then it will help you fetch more marks and keep in mind all of the points that we discussed now and make note of it now with these points in mind let us move on to the next article discussion now look at this next news article see this news article talks about a memorandum signed by lok sabha and rajya sabha members belonging to the ruling dmk led secular progressive alliance see the memorandum is to seek the removal of tamil nadu governor r n ravi and the memorandum has been submitted to rashtrapati bhavan that is it has been submitted to the president so this is about the news article given here See in the previous discussion we saw about Punchi Commission and important recommendations regarding the appointment and removal of the governor. Now in this discussion what we are going to do is we are going to understand the original procedure for the appointment and removal of governor. But before that we'll see some basics about governor. As you all know the governor is the chief executive head of the state and like president he is also a nominal executive head. See the governor acts as an agent of the central government therefore the office of governor has a dual role that is he acts as an agent of the central government and he is a nominal executive head of the state see usually there is a governor for each state but after the 7th constitutional amendment act of 1956 the appointment of same person as a governor for two or more states has been facilitated so this is some basics about the governor now coming to the appointment of the governor see the governor is neither directly elected by people nor indirectly elected by a specially constituted electoral college like the president then how is he appointed he is appointed by the president by warrant under his hand and seal this does not mean that 
the office of the governor is an employment under the central government in the year 1979 supreme court held that the office of governor is an independent constitutional office so it is not under the control of central government and it is also not a subordinate to the central government it is an independent constitutional office and this is about the appointment of the governor now coming to the term of office see a governor holds office for a term of 5 years from the date on which he enters upon his office however this term of 5 years is subjected to the pleasure of the president that is the governor has no security of tenure no fixed term of office he may be removed by the president at any time and most importantly remember the constitution does not lay down any grounds upon which a governor may be removed by the president so there is no procedure for the removal of the governor by president so this is about the appointment term and removal of the governor see while appointing the governor also there is no proper procedure he is not directly elected and he is not indirectly elected he is appointed by the president and he acts as an agent of the central government and regarding the term he is subjected to the pleasure of the president that is he may be removed by the president at any time so these are the reasons why so many commissions have recommended many provisions regarding the appointment and removal of governor and among them one of the important one is punchi commission that we saw before now that's all about this article discussion in this discussion we saw about some basics about governor appointment of governor term of office and removal of governor now with these points in mind let us move on to the next article discussion now let us see this next news article see this news article says that union cabinet has approved new guidelines for uplinking and downlinking of television channels in india so this is the crux of the news article given here in this context we are going to learn about the provisions that are introduced in the new guidelines first of all let us start our discussion by seeing why guidelines are necessary for uplinking and downlinking of television channels see guidelines are necessary because the airwaves or frequencies are categorized as public property in india so it is the duty of the government to ensure that such technologies are used in the best interest of the society so now we know why guidelines are there for the uplinking and downlinking of television channels see so far i have used these words uplink and downlink so many times now what do i mean by that see uplink and downlink they are terminologies that are used in the satellite communications know that if data is sent from the ground to the satellite then it is called as uplinking and if data is sent from satellite to the ground then it is called as downlinking see these uplinking and downlinking process they go in parallel and it is an example of two way communication and this uplinking and downlinking services are provided by various companies for the use of television network or the internet network see the tv networks they are working on this process of uplinking and downlinking only so what happens here is firstly the tv network uplink that is send their content from the ground to the satellite and then parallelly the content that is going to be broadcasted in the tv channel is downlinked from the satellite to the tv channel so this is the whole process and this whole process is only governed by the guidelines issued by the government see this is all about uplinking and downlinking now we are going to see the provisions of the new guidelines now under the new guidelines all the tv networks which are holding permission to uplink and downlink they have to broadcast content on issues of national importance and social relevance so this has been made mandatory see the broadcast should be for at least 30 minutes every day and also the guidelines had listed eight themes so the contents on the issues of national importance and social relevance should be based on these eight themes only i have listed the eight themes here pause the video and take note of it now coming back see there is an exception to this provision 
Firstly, the exception is to the foreign channels, which are downlinking in India. And secondly, the channels such as sports channel and other channels where it would not be feasible to broadcast such content is also exempted from this provision. So, other than the channels that I mentioned now, all the other channels, they have to broadcast issues of national importance and social relevance for at least 30 minutes every day. So, this is one provision in the new guidelines. And secondly, the guideline says that it would ease the process of issuing permission to the companies which have been allowed for the first time. See, this permission is for the companies which are registered in India, but it has not yet obtained permission for uplinking and downlinking. So, if the company is registered in India, but it is getting permission for uplinking and downlinking for the first time, then for those companies, the guidelines have eased the process of issuing permission. And this is the second provision. And thirdly, the guidelines, they have done away with the requirement to seek permission for live telecast of events. So, what is the procedure now? Now, only prior registration is enough for live telecast. Before, they have to obtain permission. But now, only prior registration is enough. And this is the third provision. And fourthly, as per the new guidelines, no prior permission is required for the change of language or conversion of mode of transmission from standard definition to high definition or vice versa. See, earlier the TV networks, they needed permission for the change of language or conversion of mode of transmission from SD to HD or vice versa. But now, as per the new guidelines, only prior intimation is required. Permission is not required. And finally, the guidelines also highlighted that the companies would be allowed to uplink foreign channels from Indian teleports. See, the main advantage of this provision is that they create employment opportunities and make India a teleport hub for the other countries. So, that's all regarding this article discussion. In this discussion, we saw why guidelines are needed for governing uplinking and downlinking of television channels. And after that, we saw what is mean by uplink and downlink. And finally, we ended our discussion by seeing the new provisions that are introduced in the new guidelines. Now, with these points in mind, let us move on to the next article discussion. Now, this final article here is about white paper. See, yesterday, Tamil Nadu Congress Committee President asked the Prime Minister to release a white paper on the impact of demonetization. Now, this is the crux of the news article given here. Now, using this as an opportunity, we are going to discuss what is white paper, its objectives and we are going to see some facts about green paper also. Now, first of all, what is white paper? See, the term white paper is of British origin. The birth of the term is credited to the Churchill White Paper of 1992 and it is also referred to as the British policy in the Palestine. Know that for decades, the White Paper's use was restricted only to the government-issued documents. But today, similar documents are also issued by the opposition political parties, civil societies, businesses and even research organizations. Now, coming to what really is white paper? See, it refers to a published statement of government policy or strategy. See, it is an authoritative guide or a report which provides information on complex issues in a concise form. I'll give you some of the examples of the white papers released by the Indian governments. They are White Paper on Data Protection Framework for India 2017, White Paper on Focused Interventions for Make in India 2020 and White Paper on Black Money 2012. So, these are all the basics about White Paper. So, it is a published statement of government policy or strategy. It provides information on complex issues in a brief manner. Now, coming to its objectives, see, the main idea of White Papers is to help the stakeholders. So, what is the White Paper doing? The white paper is helping the stakeholders to understand an issue, identify the roadblocks, that is nothing but the obstacles, and find solutions to the different problems. And apart from this, white papers also help governments to come up with their strategies on prevalent issues in the country. And they also help governments to take 
far sighted decisions so these are all the objectives of white paper now coming to its role see white paper performs two important roles firstly it is used in presenting the government policy preferences prior to the introduction of legislation so what does this mean before introducing a bill in the legislature the released white paper gives an idea about the government policy preferences and secondly it is used to test the climate of public opinion regarding a controversial policy issue see these two roles of the white paper enables the government to calculate the probable impact of a particular policy see this is why white paper is released now in the article today tamil nadu congress committee president asked the prime minister to release a white paper on the impact of demonetization so this comes under the second role of white paper if a white paper is released on the impact of demonetization then we all know what is happening and what measures are taken by the government etc now with this information about white paper let us move on to see about green paper here what we are going to do is we are going to compare green paper with white paper for better understanding see white paper it is a published statement of government policy or strategy it contains the reasons and details of a planned legislative change whereas the green paper refers to a consultation document produced by the government on a particular policy see here the green paper it is only the first step towards legislation and it is aimed at seeking views from interested parties before proceeding with the policy so know about this difference green paper it is like a consultating document it consults all the stakeholders even obtains the feedback of the public but white paper it is the published document of government policy or strategy like i said already it contains the reasons and details of the planned legislative change so this is the main difference and the other difference is the role of public in both of the papers see the role of public on white paper is less because it contains only the reasons for the planned legislation whereas the green paper is more open ended it encourages the public views opinion and feedback on particular policy so this is the other difference now that's all about this article discussion i hope you understand what is white paper and what is green paper see know that the first step towards legislation is green paper it is like consulting the stakeholders and obtaining feedback from the public etc but white paper it is a published document which contains reasons and details of the planned legislative change see both papers they enable the government to calculate the probable impact of a particular policy now with these points in mind let us move on to the next part of the discussion that is the practice prelims question discussion today we have six prelims questions i'll solve five of them and one of them is a quiz question for you now let us start with this first question which among the following paths are correct see on the one side earthquake zones are given and on the other side states under the zones are given we have to identify which state belong to which zone zone 2 jammu and kashmir zone 3 kerala zone 4 andaman and nicobar and zone 5 all of the northeastern states see the whole country has been divided into four zones they are zone 5 4 3 and 2 and they are divided according to the seismic zoning map of india which was prepared by bureau of indian standards and they prepared this map based on the historical seismicity and the strong ground motions see out of the four zones zone 5 exhibits the highest seismic risk and zone 2 has the least risk now look at this image here Zone 5 includes parts of Jammu and Kashmir, western part of Himachal Pradesh, eastern part of Uttarakhand, Kutch region in Gujarat, part of northern Bihar, all of the northeastern states and Andaman and Nicobar islands. And zone 5 it includes Ladakh, remaining parts of Jammu and Kashmir, Himachal Pradesh, Uttarakhand, some parts of Haryana, parts of Punjab, Delhi, Sikkim, northern part of Uttar Pradesh. 
small portions of Bihar and West Bengal, parts of Gujarat and small portions of Maharashtra near the west coast and small part of western Rajasthan. And zone 3 includes Kerala, Goa, Lakshadweep Islands, parts of Uttar Pradesh and Haryana, remaining parts of Gujarat, Punjab, parts of West Bengal, Western Rajasthan, Madhya Pradesh, remaining part of Bihar, northern parts of Jharkhand and Chhattisgarh, parts of Maharashtra, Odisha, Andhra Pradesh, Telangana, Tamil Nadu and Karnataka. And zone 2 contains remaining parts of Rajasthan, Uttar Pradesh, Gujarat, Haryana, Madhya Pradesh, Maharashtra, Odisha, Andhra Pradesh, Telangana, Karnataka and Tamil Nadu. Now coming to the question. See, it is given as Jammu and Kashmir comes under zone 2. This statement is incorrect because the entire Jammu and Kashmir region is categorized under zone 5 and zone 4. So we know that pair 1 is incorrect. So we can easily eliminate option A and option C. Now from the options we know that Pair 2 is correct because it is available in both the options. So we have to check Pair 3 and Pair 4. Pair 3 is given us Andaman and Nicobar region comes under Zone 4. This pair is also incorrect because the entire region of Andaman and Nicobar comes under Zone 5. So if we know this, we can easily find out the correct answer which is Option D, 2 and 4 only. Now coming to the second question, consider the following projects. Nuclear power generation, direct waste incineration, palm oil industries, hydropower plants larger than 25 megawatts. Which of the projects given above comes under the excluded projects list of the issuance of sovereign green bonds? See in the discussion itself, we saw that Expenditures directly related to fossil fuel are excluded from the sovereign green bonds. Now look at this image here. In this image, I have listed the excluded projects for issuance of sovereign green bonds. It includes projects involving new or existing extraction, production and distribution of fossil fuels, including improvement and upgrades or where the core energy source is fossil fuel based. And the second project which is excluded from the sovereign green bond is nuclear power generation, direct waste incineration, alcohol, weapons, tobacco, gaming or palm oil industries and even renewable energy projects generating energy from biomass using feedstock originating from protected areas, landfill projects and hydropower plants larger than 25 megawatt. So now take the question, from what we saw we know that all of these projects are excluded from the sovereign green bonds. So the correct answer to this question is option D, all the above. Now coming to the third question, which of the following products have GI tag? Statement 1, Manipuri black rice. Statement 2, Pashmina shawls. Statement 3, Mysore silk. And statement 4, Kashmir saffron. So you know that all of these products have GI tag in India. So what is the correct answer here? It is option D, all the above. Now moving on to the next question, which one of the following suggested that the governor should be an eminent person from outside the state and should be a detached figure without intense political link or should not have taken part in politics in the recent past? Option A, First Administrative Reforms Commission 1966. Option B, Raj Manar Committee, 1969. Option C, Sarkaria Commission, 1983. And Option D, National Commission to Review the Working of the Constitution, 2000. See, the correct answer is Option C, Sarkaria Commission. See, even before the Punchi Commission, the Sarkaria Commission was created by Central Government in 1983 to recommend changes in the centre-state relationship. The Commission submitted its report in 1988 and the Sarkaria Commission said that government should be an eminent person from outside the state and should be a detached figure without any intense political link or should not have taken part in politics in the recent past. And this was reiterated or accepted by the Punchi Commission. Now moving on to the next question. According to the recent guidelines of the Ministry of Information and Broadcasting, which of the following are the themes of socially relevant content that need to be broadcasted in TV channels on daily basis. Statement 1. Agriculture and Rural Development. Statement 2. Welfare of Women. 
Statement 3, Protection of Environment and of Cultural Heritage. Statement 4, National Integration. And Statement 5, Welfare of Weaker Sections of the Society. See, the correct answer to this question is Option D, All the Above. See, during our discussion, I asked you to pass the video and read the themes that need to be broadcasted in TV channels, right? So, that is what this question is about. We saw that there are eight themes. One is education and spread of literacy. Second one is agriculture and rural development. Third one is health and family welfare. Fourth one is science and technology. Fifth one is welfare of women. Sixth one is welfare of weaker sections of the society. Seventh one is protection of environment and of cultural heritage. And the eighth one is national integration. So again, the correct answer to this question is option D, all the above. Now moving on to the final question. See viewers, this is only the quiz question for you. Read the question carefully, think about it and post your answer in the comment section. Aspirants, I have given here a mains question. So interested people, write it and post your answer in the comment section. If you have any query related to the articles that we discussed today, post that also in the comment section. And with this, we have come to the end. If you find the video useful, like, share and comment and do subscribe to Shankar IA's Academy's YouTube channel for further updates. Thank you.